Good afternoon and welcome to this controller session with Peter Fincham, uh, Director of Television at ITV. I've just found out that I am the seventh person to interview Peter Fincham in succession at Edinburgh. <laughs> clearly, clearly they were scraping the barrel and had finally run out of other options, but we will do the best we can. And I want to congratulate you. We also found out that there was an alternative um, attraction, shall we say, the Downton Ma uh, Masterclass. You show great taste and discrimination by coming here instead of there, for which we both um, uh, thank you. Um, you, you can tweet uh, your, your, your comments, your questions throughout, hash uh, Sidlaw, but also all modern technologies here, and the instructions are on the screen, you can text, you can use Skype, you can use every goddamn thing. But I think there's a promise up there of anonymity. I'm not sure we can actually guarantee that, so please try not to commit professional suicide via Twitter. Um, <laughs> You can still ask, you can still ask tough, tough questions. Peter Fincham, a couple of gentle, almost embarrassingly easy lobbying questions just to warm you up. You're a multimillionaire from your days in, 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 in The Independent. Why in the name of God are you still doing this? Why are you exposing yourself to headlines in the Daily Mail, Daily Mail ratings crash? Why aren't you off doing something more interesting? I haven't had any headlines in the Daily Mail lately, unless you know something I don't. Ah, uh, to watch for tomorrow. Watch yeah, for the tomorrow. gentleman from the Daily Mail here. Um, uh, well, do you know what? Um, being director of television of ITV, is a, it's a fantastic job. Um, uh, what, you know, what, what more could you ask to do? You, you're, you're, responsible for, um, you're responsible for the output of five channels, uh, broadcasting 24-7, you know, huge amount of original output every year. Um, uh, it's you know, where the UK's you know, leading commercial broadcaster... Yes, yes, yes. The, so your no, appetite, no, no, no. The, the no, short answer so is your appetite for work is undimmed. Yeah, 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 but, but, but I, I, I'm surprised if that seems surprising. I mean, what am I going to go and do, go and, you know, grow mushrooms or somewhere in the countryside? I, I don't want to do that. I work in television. I love television. I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that, that in my earlier incarnation in Talkback, I, you know, that, that, that went well and gave me some financial independence. But, but, but that didn't mean I didn't want to go on working in television. Then, then you, you, you know, I, I got, I didn't really have a plan. If I go back to when I left Talkback, um, but when I was offered the job of controller of BBC One, well, you're not going to turn that down. It's such a fantastic job. And then when you're offered the director of television at ITV, yes. it's probably the only job that's better than that. So, one, so that's why. I just, one, I enjoy one it. final historic uh, question. And you mentioned controller of BBC One. Many people, including myself, thought you were treated as a scapegoat um, by the great Queen walking back and walking backwards scandal. Is it out of your system now? Is there just a slight trace of bitterness remaining? Uh, no, not at all. Um, for one thing, it seems like a really long time ago, although, funnily enough, when it was at the height of that, it was in this very room that I was interviewed, in fact, that year by Jeremy Vine. And, and there were people sort of standing in the aisles and up in those balconies. They all obviously they were here wanted, for your they wanted to hear about my polish, the future yeah. of BBC One. It was yeah. like some weird kind of public trial or whatever. Uh, but it's a long time ago now. Um, uh, and any, any emotion I felt about it kind of washed out of my okay. system very quickly afterwards. Um, and, you know, I you know, watched BBC One from a distance uh, uh, under first Jay Hunt, now Danny Cohen. I've, I've always said this, and I don't say it just because it's the obvious thing to say. I mean it uh, uh, in, the, in the huge world of television where there's, you know, whatever there is, 350 channels. Um, BBC One and ITV One have got as much in common with each other as they've got to divide each other. I, they both fly the flag for mainstream television aimed at large audiences. Um, so, you know, I've been, I'm, I think I'm the only person You're the only ever, person yeah, who's done both I've, jobs. I've run, run both, um, but the, there's not a, a trace of, of uh, you know, residual kind of feeling about what happened to BBC, not at all. Is there a residual feeling that you're actually a BBC con One controller in disguise if just, just plying your trade down the road? No, I don't, I don't think so at all. And I, and I think uh, uh, that I ITV... Uh, I certainly, you know, tried to take ITV1 in some particular directions, and I've got strong feelings about what ITV1 should be. Um, uh, and I don't believe, if you like, that ITV1 
should be a channel that wants to uh, position itself like down market of BBC One or um, that, 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 you know, that in, in, when you're at BBC One, you can do certain things you can't do at ITV One. But uh, I would say... So what is your approach well, then? What I was going to say is I would say deep in my heart, and this you know, goes back to all my years as an indie, I'm probably more comfortable in a commercial organisation. And, and, and I, in that sense, ITV One is a commercial organisation, uh, as, of course, is any Indian talkback was talkback Thames, whereas the BBC isn't. The BBC is fundamentally, it's a, you know, it's a publicly funded public service organisation. So I'd say, you know, I'm, I'm probably more naturally within the ITV world, actually. Okay. Last year at Edinburgh, uh, Jimmy Malville, you will recall, uh, suggested that your bosses, Archie Norman and Adam Crozier, might be trying to industrialise television and turn it into the equivalent of a baked bean factory. And, and they suggested that the key thing they had to do was allow Peter Fincham to do his job. Have they? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and that's, a, that's an unfair characterisation of, uh, of Archie and Adam, who... Uh, um, uh, aren't like that at all. And, uh, what are they like? Um, well, they, they, I mean, they're quite different to previous ITV management in as much as they you know, respect, respectively come from different worlds and don't, you, you, know, you know, Michael Grade have been in television since, uh, you, you know, who knows when, but, but, but Archie and Adam, uh, uh, you know, came from outside. I think actually for ITV, that was enormously refreshing. To Wasn't have the there a worry? Wasn't there some, yeah, no, some I, part I take, of your worry no, 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 that the people point. who come well, from the post office and ASDA yeah. were your bosses? But if they were going to turn it into whatever, you, whatever you're describing it as, or Jimmy was describing it as a baked bean factory, they'd have done it by now. And they absolutely haven't done it by now. And they fully understand uh, that television is not like that. You can, you can take all those analogies. Uh, and, you know, previous ITV management, uh, uh, not when I was at ITV, I, I, I know in the old days, one of the chief executives used to say, we've got to think like Tesco's, you know, the, uh, the programs of the products and not, on the And shelves. not Asda. Well, it did. It did. But, 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 but Arch and Adam, you, it would be absolutely unfair to characterise them, if you like, in that rather crass way. They, uh, they, and, and in terms, it's straightforward to your question, have they let me get on with the job? Absolutely, absolutely. Indeed. By any standards, an impressive showreel provided by ITV. Um, but the more <laughs> acute members of the audience will have noticed there wasn't room for a clip from Daybreak there, was there? <laughs> Well, why we, the, we broadcast a very large number of programmes and there wasn't in, uh, a clip from this morning indeed, or indeed, Loose Women indeed, or indeed, indeed, how many more do you want uh, Can I remind you of what your two star presenters uh, said about this programme? Adrian Childs, we woke up in the morning and found out that far from being OK, it was actually one of the biggest crocks of shite anyone had seen for years. And Miss Blakely uh, said there are things that don't work and we'll change them we have in the most significant, we have the most significant view that at 6 a.m. it's pitch black. Didn't anybody think about winter coming, for goodness sake? Well, look, um, uh, the, go back to, you know, the, 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 Adrian first. A, Adrian's, he's a brilliant television presenter and, and uh, you know, we're, we couldn't be more proud to have him on ITV, not only in Daybreak, he presents our football for us, he does a show of his own called that Sunday Night Show, which is very successful. And his stock in trade, uh, he, part of his stock in trade, you might say, is to sort of kind of speak his mind and say, say what he honestly thinks. And I respect him for that. So I've, I have absolutely no problem uh, uh, at all with that. I think over the last year, and it's almost a year now since Daybreak uh, launched, we've certainly found that, 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 that Daybreak's found itself in, in the headlines. Um, in that sense, uh, uh, it's pretty firmly in the tradition of previous ITV breakfast launches. There have only been three. There's been TVAM, GMTV, and Daybreak. Uh, so you were, um, trying to stay all, you were trying to stay consistent, were you? No, no, they've all, they've all, they, they've all had some turbulence, if you like, like early on. I mean, I think, I think at breakfast, people's, I think breakfast is a very distinctive part of the schedule. People's habits at breakfast, not only their television habits, their habits, we're all creatures of habit at breakfast, and so change at, at breakfast time uh, uh, probably is, is, you know, is, is more striking to people than it is at other parts of the schedule. You, know, you, you, you eat the same thing for breakfast every morning, you don't eat the same thing in the evening, as it were. So I think that, I think that with hindsight, the, the kind of the turbulence, the sort of headwinds that we faced in the press uh, um, 
uh, um, I'm not particularly surprised about. Um, it, 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 GMTV have been on air for 17 years. There's a lot of loyalty with the program of that length, quite understandable. It had a fantastic run. Um, I think there's a gap here. If, you're, if what you know of Daybreak is what you read, um, but you don't watch it yourself, I think you'll have a, a, a wrong image of Daybreak. If you're a regular viewer of it, I don't know if you are, Ray, but if you're a regular viewer of it, uh, I think you'll see something quite different. Daybreak's a good show, and it's a show that's settled, uh, and it entertains its audience. It does something distinctively different from, from the BBC. Um, it's a show we'd probably like to get to a, you know, a different place from where it is at the moment. There's going to be more changes in Daybreak. Um, as you probably know, there's going to be a new editor, which we'll uh, announce in due course. It's work in progress. Of, of course it's work in progress. But Peter, um, Peter, I once spoke to a specialist in breakfast television who told me that Daybreak, the relaunch of Daybreak, broke every rule and got everything possible wrong that you could get wrong about a breakfast program. You're director of television. You must take responsibility for that, mustn't well, you? Well, uh, um, breaking every rule is something we normally say is a really good thing to do. So, so you know, breaking every rule isn't in itself a, a sin. We all uh, you know, ought to be taking risks all the time and doing things differently and trying to do things differently. differently. Uh, in terms of taking responsibility, well, of course, I take responsibility for the output of ITV on all channels, all, all hours of day and night. So no, uh, no question of, uh, about that at all. Um, and I'm, I'm not sitting here uh, and saying that from programme one last September, uh, Daybreak hasn't got anything wrong or has, or has been... Uh, if you like the kind of uh, full and finished article, it's it, it, it's a lot better than than in a sense uh, it's sometimes characterised. It has got better. It has settled. It continues to improve, and it will continue to improve. Are you therefore now happy with it? Uh, well, am I happy with it? Uh, I'm going to broaden that out, if you like, to all our output. No, never quite happy with all our output because there's always room for improvement in all corners of our output. Uh, would I like Daybreak to, uh, to, to, to broaden its audience, to continue to evolve? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, but a lot has gone on and a lot of con work continues to go on. And, and good Does work. that mean that you're therefore happy with the presenters, Adrian yes. Child and Christine Blakely, and yes. that they will stay in that role? Yes, no doubts, no ifs, no buts. No ifs, no buts. And yet that was what my expert um, said was one of the things wrong. There were great TV presenters, well, I don't know but who, not for breakfast. Who does your, is your expert um, anonymous? Yes, I think so. OK. But, okay. but, um, but, but there's, a, there's been about 15 years' experience in breakfast television, so yeah. I'm not just... It wasn't somebody I met, you know, but down you the know, Oxford Road. I'm, 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 I'm dare say there's somebody, you, you know, who... who no, sorry, the serious point, no, no, Peter, but it's, were, it's they, serious. were they the wrong yeah. people to launch no, such no, a programme? but right, and, and whoever your expert is, um, uh, uh, you know, I'd be very interested to hear their views, but, but, you know, to use that kind of old Hollywood phrase, nobody knows anything. And so 15 years' experience in breakfast in the past doesn't mean you know what the formula... Uh, uh, you, you know, I mean, I just go back to your point about uh, your expert said it broke every rule. Well, one of the most, I suppose, successful breakfast shows the last 20 years or so, The Big Breakfast, broke every rule. That was a good thing to do. That was a good thing. So yeah. one moment, it's a good thing to yeah. do, and the other minute, yeah. you, you might say it's, it's yeah. not the right thing okay, to do. OK, let's move on to a, another D that you will have, have a greater pleasure having raised, Downton Abbey. Okay. Yeah. Now, I've, I've, I've heard that inside ITV there was some surprise at its success and that there was even some doubt where it would appear in the schedule and was it a risky thing to do? Well, um, I, I, I don't know, again, I don't know quite where, you, where you've heard that from, but I, I would say this because people have sometimes said to me, oh, you must have known Downton Abbey would be a hit to which I've always said, well, you never know. You don't know anything. So with Downton Abbey, it was one of those shows where we thought the scripts were very good. Um, uh, it came from an impeccable source, Carnival, a very good production company, uh, uh, and written by Julian Fellows. It then, you know, we commissioned it. They shot it. That all went very well. We looked at the tapes as they come in. They seemed very good. That, doesn't, that didn't mean that the day before it was broadcast, I knew it would be a success, because I've seen all those things happen and ticked all those boxes along the way, and then the public decided, no, it's not for us. So, so I, don't, I don't know about the idea of it being a surprise that it was a success. We thought it would go well. But the point I'm making is never, ever, ever 
say, I know that show's a hit, before the audience has decided it's a hit. Yes. In that sense, it's always a surprise, if you like. It's a delightful surprise when, when, when what you think is good is embraced by the audience. I wasn't surprised in as much as I'd always thought it was very good indeed. It, was, it wasn't a probable thing for ITV to do. We hadn't been in period drama in any significant way for a long time. So it, it, in that sense, you, you know, as, as the moment of it launching approaches, you're sort of crossing your fingers and thinking, I think an ITV audience will like this. But, you know, it's not a science. It's, it's, it's a guessing game. Of course it is. Is it true that the third series has already been written and you're already starting to think of uh, fifth, sixth, seventh uh, series of Downton Abbey? I, I think that the, the, uh, um, before we broadcast the first series, Julian had it mapped out somewhere down, you know, some way down the road. But again, you, you, know, you, you respond to the audience and you respond to, you, you don't know which characters will resonate most with the audience. The second series wasn't written until the first series had gone out. And I'm, I'm sure well, you'd need to ask Julian at the, the master class that's going on at the moment. I'm sure... We should have a dual feed, shouldn't we? Could, we? Could. we could do both uh, sessions I'm, at once. I'm, yeah. I'm sure the response to the first series will have shaped some of what he wrote in the second series. It'd be, it'd be very surprising mm. if it didn't. Sure. Two more Ds that were slightly unusual. Uh, Full-length documentaries and the emphasis we just saw on drama. Are, are, are those two genres shaped your, your view of how ITV should be in the future? Well, I, I think that um, uh, in ITV1, you can tend to have your focus, uh, for very understandable reasons, on the, the sort of the big... Uh, entertainment, drama, live sport, the sort of, you know, the big guns that, that will deliver very big audiences. But I believe very strongly that, that ITV1 is defined by the great range of what it does, as well as, it's, it's not just by the peaks, if you like, mm -hmm. it's by a great range of things. So we've put a lot of emphasis in the last year uh, or, or so on, on factual and documentaries. We've had, you, you know, I think some notable successes with um, series like uh, Strange Ways, with a series like Long Lost Family. We've launched an art strand, Perspectives. Uh, we're launching a, a current affairs strand, uh, Exposure this autumn. Um, I, I think what you, you might be interesting in that is that some of the things that a public service broadcast broadcaster once did sort of because they were told to, or because a quota sort of from a regulator said, you need to make X hours of such and such a, a, a genre this year. Those quotas have mostly fallen away. They're not really there anymore. Um, and yet, actually, you come, you come back around and say, well, we're going to do them because we want to do them, because this makes the ITV schedule rich and varied. And, and then, of course, if you, if you do them well, you find there are really substantial audiences out there. You, in a strange way, say, six and a half million viewers. Have a really tough, uncompromising material, uh, not in any way kind of watered down or dumbed down or, or, or whatever. Um, the, the, you know, there's, there's big audiences for intelligent and interesting program. You know, you know that saying, you can't underestimate the uh, taste of the general public. I was, that's bollocks. It's the exact opposite. You can very easily underestimate the taste of the general public. In fact, you're much, much better to go in the other direction and say, let's, let's you know, whether it's Downton Abbey or whether it's Strange Rays or whatever, uh, let's put something that's, you know, got quite a lot to it in front of the audience and then they'll, they'll, they'll come to it. One from, one from the audience. Um, do you think the success of um, Britain's Got Talent and X Factor without Simon Cowell suggests ITV doesn't need him on screen anymore? Oh, no. I mean, Simon was in Britain's Got Talent. He, 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 he was in the, 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 the live uh, uh, strip of semi-finals and final at the end of Britain's Got Talent. We were absolutely delighted, and, and, and I you know, hope it will continue to be. I mean, so, uh, you know, ITV's relationship with Simon Cowell has been enormously fruitful one continues to be so it is a relationship and obviously you, you know you, you see him on screen but to us he's also a producer he's you know he's also creating uh, uh, ideas and formats and we're, we're about to launch a big show i will uh, indeed ask you about that sure, later sure, sure. of course I um so to us it's not just simon on yeah. screen it's a bit it's simon yeah. in different guises yeah. but of course i'm delighted that uh, britain's got talent britain's got talent is is the highest rating entertainment show this year on UK television by some are margin you, are you, and I'm delighted with the launch of The X Factor last weekend. Are you becoming too dependent on Simon Cowell in well, the sense that for whatever reason 
he is a temperamental character. For whatever reason he fell out with you, you would have enormous holes in your schedule. He's, he's, he's really not a temperamental character, by the way. Um, I've worked with a lot of, a lot of you know, temperamental stars characters. and very famous people, and so I'm most untemperamental. But, uh, I mean, that is, a, if I may say so, a familiar question. But, but, you know, last weekend we launched the, the, the X Factor with, with Gary Barlow and, uh, and, and you know, Kelly and Talisa and Louis and... And, and it was the joint biggest launch it's ever had with the year before. So, so in a sense, you know, that shows, and he's absolutely delighted about this, the, these shows do not need him sitting there every week. Well, you can't, you can't say we didn't uh, sort of heap you with quite a lot of praise there. However, the lady who laughed like a drain at your great 50th anniversary Coronation Street tragedy, uh, did that come off? Yes, it, it absolutely came off. And, and in fact, if you look at Coronation Street and Emmerdale, let's to kind of talk about them both together, um, more people watch both those shows than did a year ago. That's, that, that, that may not seem remarkable, but that's after years and years in which the audiences for soaps went sort of only in one direction. As multi-channel television blossomed and grew, uh, uh, you know, soaps just sort of went down. The question was, did they go down 3%, 5% year, year on year? 5% more people watch Emmerdale uh, this year than last year, and it's about 25 two to 3% more on Coronation Street. Now, of course, it's not only about the race, it's also about the quality of the show. And I think Coronation Street's 50th anniversary was one of its peaks, one of its high points in the, in, in the last year. By no means it's its only peak or high point. We started to do something with Coronation Street, which we're doing in a couple of weeks' time. We did it uh, 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 during Britain's Got Talent as well, which is to, to, to play it at nine o'clock for five days during one of these big uh, entertainment strips. And, and I think that's doing a very interesting thing, which is to say... The soaps are there all the time, but you can make them an event. You can turn them into event television as much as the X Factor's event television. I think that's Talk, one of Peter, the reasons talking, talking, people have responded so well. Talking about event television, could you explain to me why the road to Coronation Street drama was on BBC4 and not on ITV? Well, I mean, the road to, the, the road to Coronation Street was a, a brilliant film, by the way, and uh, I think has won awards and, 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 and rightly won awards. Um, Did you turn it down? To, well, the... the, the Let's. Ah, yes, is the, yes is the answer. No, 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 but there's no, there's no secret about this. It would not have belonged on ITV One, okay? Because it's not. It wasn't. It, it, this was a. This was a, a backstage drama about the creation of Coronation Street at the very beginning. It didn't feel like an ITV One drama. But I, I, I sort of go further than that because it was about the making of Coronation Street. I think it was sort of in its own way better that it wasn't on an ITV channel. It needed the distance that was created by being on another channel. And, and I think that it, it would have, you know, I think, I think BBC4, as it, as it happens, was probably exactly you, the right home you, for it. Do you feel the same about, about The Voice? It's better being on another channel, BBC1? Ah, well, The Voice, I mean... You, you bid know, for the, that, didn't the, you? The, uh, we, we certainly had conversations about The Voice... Um, the Voice is going to BBC One. Uh, um, I, you know, wish them luck with the Voice. I mean, you know, the obviously we have we have the X Factor. We have the biggest singing talent show um, uh, in the UK. It occupies a lot of our schedule. It, it stretches from the, you know, the end of August uh, through to Christmas. We've also got Britain's Got Talent. You know, we 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 are well stocked with these big talent shows. Um, we certainly did. We did indeed talk to the you know the people who were kind of selling the voice, but I think, I think, you know, if I were them, to be honest, I'd have probably ended up saying, oh, I'm going to go to BBC One for, for the obvious reason that okay. we've got these shows. I don't think they would have wanted to be in the X Factor's shadow. It might have felt inevitable that they were in the X Factor's shadow. Okay. And, and uh, in, in some respects, I suspect this is one of those things where, as I say, you know, ITV One and BBC One, they're the only two mainstream channels. Um, if there's room, and the BBC will find this out when they do it, if there's room for another big singing talent show of that sort, then the room is probably on BBC One. OK, another one from the floor. Why hasn't ITV cracked comedy yet? I mean, that's no laughing matter, is it? Um, we, I, I think it's a very fair question. And I think if you go back some years, and uh, I, I don't know when, because I'd have to sort of, you, you know do a bit of sort of history, investigative history of ITV1. I think ITV maybe lost its nerve a little bit with comedy, perhaps because comedy 
is a high-risk genre. It's not a genre where, you know, if you commission one comedy, you can't guarantee you'll get one hit. You've got to, you've got to try a few out. And in a very commercial channel like ITV1, maybe that felt like a very high risk. I think comedy more generally started to gravitate some years ago to channels like BBC Three and E4, uh, and a lot of talent, you know, assumed that this was the place to go. Um, uh, are, you gonna, very, gonna very some, much, yeah, are you going to do something about I, that? I'd very, very much like to do something about it. We have, we have some very successful comedy. We have Ben Adorn, which is hugely successful, uh, uh, came back uh, uh, recently with its most successful series yet. We have Harry Hill, of course, uh, which is a different category, not scripted comedy, but uh, you know what he does on Saturday night is fantastic. We love Harry Hill, but we could do more. We've got some more, in, we've got some more that we've announced in the, in, in the pipeline. We've got a new scripted series from Carolina Hearn. We've got another one uh, um, from Hattrick Productions. Uh, um, uh, and we will do more, and we're talking to people about doing more. We're thinking of bringing it together into a sort of comedy season, but I haven't, I haven't got any kind of firm plans for that yet, to see whether I can kind of kickstart it a little bit. I absolutely believe uh, every year in May, the, 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 we go, and so do the other broadcasters, we all go over to, uh, uh, to the screenings in Los Angeles. And this year, the, the, for the first time that I can remember, the comedy was better than the drama. Um, uh, it seemed fresher. It seemed newer and funnier. And, and funny enough, the funniest comedies were the ones played in front of audiences with, with laughter tracks. I, what a, until quite recently seemed quite old-fashioned, in a sort of what goes around comes around way, suddenly felt fresh and funny. And I thought, well, that is significant. Comedy is a mainstream genre. The right comedy can get to big audiences, you know, like the BBC have with, with Miranda or I had with Little Britain. Uh, uh, um, uh, so, no, I think this is a very fair point. And, and I think that ITV, well, I would like to think that over the next year or two, we can make a difference and we can bring more. <laughs> it's not only about ITV1, by the way, that's also about ITV. Too, but that's not what we're here to talk about now. We do right, stuff right. Well. we've identified opportunity for, for producers and independent uh, programme makers. The man wants more comedy and better comedy. So it's an obvious follow, uh, follow up question because I know most of you are here for one reason the stories of the past, and we'll obviously talk about ratings and boring old stuff like that, but mostly you want to know how to sell this man programme ideas and make some money. So let's, um, what do you, well, apart from comedy, what are you looking for at the moment? How do people approach you? Is ITV a bureaucratic organisation? And is there real openings for new creative ideas from, whoever, from wherever they come from? Well, we like to think we're not a bureaucratic organisation. Uh, we certainly have uh, leaner kind of, you, you know, system, leaner structures in terms of getting programmes commissioned. I mean, I think somebody on that tape mentioned the stable team we have at ITV1, and, and I think that is a very important thing. We have a stable team. We have a very good feel for the channel. Um, uh, I think that we're 100% open for business. I mean, one thing I would say about ITV1, acquisitions plays a relatively very small part in what we do. Most of what we spend, we spend on UK-originated programmes made by a huge range of producers. Um, some of our commercial rivals, you, you know, I, was, I was mentioning the LA screenings, some of our commercial rivals have spent very significant parts of their budget buying American series, American sitcoms and dramas from that. That's money they can't now spend on original commissions. We can and do spend a lot of money on original commissions uh, in all the main genres. We, uh, uh, Drama, entertainment, comedy, factual, uh, all the different kind of, uh, you know, areas of factual. Uh, I'd, I'd add one more thing to that, which is that, um, that there's a sort of rhythm to ITV's commissioning uh, that relates to some degree to big sporting uh, tournaments. So if we have a year where we've got a World Cup, like last year or next year, the European Championships, uh, uh, when those are on air, there's, there's less commissioned programmes. Uh, uh, this year we have the Rugby World Cup, which is next month in October. Look a little bit further forward to 2013, and of course we're, um, uh, we're, we're planning for 2013 and absolutely commissioning for 2013 now. Uh, there is no big sporting tournament of that sort. Our commissions go up. So come, yeah. come 2013, we are hungry for great ideas in all the main recognisable genres. Except that many independents have told me, and indeed it's, it's echoed by um, a comment just put forward here, that although your commissioners say they want new ideas, actually they don't. They want um, something safe, 
often something derivative. And just to read it, just to read out um, the version of this that's before me, other than Simon Cowell projects, are there really any opportunities for indies for genuinely new formats? Are you are you are your people really prepared to take a risk? Yes, totally. And uh, I mean, I think it was mentioned in the tape there uh, a program like Long Lost Family. Uh, that's not an entertainment program at all. That's a factual program. It's a format program from wall to wall from an independent company, an excellent independent company. Uh, we'd been looking for a long while for a formatted show of that sort that could play at nine o'clock on ITV1 that felt like ITV1. We, we'd like three or four more. You know, we, we can accommodate. You find, they're really hard to find. They're, and this is where, as you get towards the mainstream, and you're seeking to attract a big and broad audience, it gets tougher and tougher. Uh, and, and I can see the point of view, but if you, if, you kind of, if, you, if, if you did what I do, you'd see it from the other point of view. I can see the point of view that says, ah, oh, that means you, th you want things that are uh, in, you, you know, resemble other things or aren't uh, uh, wholly original or whatever. I don't agree with it at all. In fact, it's harder to be original and get to a big mainstream audience than it is to be original and get to a kind of cult or niche audience. That's, you know, that's not what we do. We're not in the cult or niche business. So you need to have the, 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 the breadth of ambition to say, well, we want to get to six, eight million people. Before having a look at your upcoming offerings, the summer ratings, you must be deeply depressed by the worst ratings in ITV1's history, unless I'm much mistaken. <laughs> Well, we've, uh, we've tried a lot of new things this summer, and, and that's a good thing. And, and if, if we hadn't tried a lot of new things, you, you might reasonably sit here and say, well, you've played safe this summer. So, you know, again, you know, the, the sort of playing safe argument, you can't have it both you, ways. You, you can't, you can't have, it, ha have it all ways. And we've also put out, I think, some, some very good shows. Um, uh, ITV, and I've learned this, you know, in the time that I've been at ITV, is more seasonal for perfectly understandable co commercial reasons than, than the BBC. And of course, BBC One's our main rival for viewers. So, you know, BBC One, and again, no quarrel with this, this is their, this is their, uh, their, their strategy. Uh, it's changed a little bit since I was there, is that during the summer they will play something like New Tricks, which is, you know, big, you know, really big rating, uh, kind of warhorse of a programme, through, right through July, August. It would be commercially improbable for us to play the equivalent of that through July, August. So we've, this summer in particular, uh, tried out quite a number of new things. Uh, we, we, you know, there hasn't been a World Cup, there hasn't been a European Championship. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, yeah we've, we've had a quieter summer than we certainly... I mean, the first, the first five months, six months, up until about the middle of June, was, I think, uh, uh, and you may have the statistics, the most successful first six months of a year ITV had had in, I can't remember whether it's 10 or 20 years. It's a long, long time. We, you know, we were at, you know, up in absolute terms. The short terms answer is you're of... not concerned by what you see as a cyclical phenomenon. Uh, no, uh, I would say, um, I think that's, 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 a, that's a good point. It's quite a difficult point. The, the commercial kind of voice in you says, says, uh, you should follow the advertising money and therefore you should, you should pack the autumn and pack the winter and spring. Um, the, you know, the competitive voice in you would like to be you know, winning all year round, of course. But, but it is, in that sense, ITV1 is different to, to the BBC. Okay. So. Is it true that red or black could cost you £15 million? Pounds? Uh, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, I can't remember. I mean, uh, oh, uh, come, it's a, come, come, uh, Mr. Fincher. Uh, uh, you're I, an honest I could gentleman. ask my director. I, 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 I could ask my director of entertainment. She's sitting in the front row. It didn't how, cost that, how, did it? Then, then, no. then, head of entertainment in the front row. What is the? Hang on, hang figure? on. No, no, but hang on. I want to know what the. I didn't want to know what lies behind the question. Are you saying if we spent too much on it? I might, because, depending because, on your answer. Because what I would say to that, and I, I can't remember what the budget is, uh, um, is that absolutely what ITV should be doing should be investing in a, an original idea um, at the top end in the belief that that's our job to say, let's do things of scale. Let's do things, you know, people, people want a cinematic experience on television. You know, more people than ever um, are, this is one of those sort of little reported statistics, uh, whatever 
else is going on in television? Everybody knows television viewing is going up. That's great. But more people are buying televisions than ever before. And they're buying enormous televisions. You know, they, they used to think 42 inches was big enough. Now it's 50, 55, 60 inches. You've got to fill those with big programs. So I kind of make no apology for the fact that Red or Black is an ambitious programme. If, if, if we were underfunding it, you should criticise us for that. What about, what about people who've um, criticised you for that this programme will encourage gambling in that it, they ostentatiously say absolutely no skill is involved? Well, it's, it's not about gambling. It's the, the people in it don't gamble. They, 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 they back red or black. Uh, gambling implies uh, you, you, you stake your money. They don't stake their money at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's hardly the first, uh, first programme on television to have had a million pounds as a prize. Um, in fact, I think uh, ITV probably did that with Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which is many years ago now. So. Isn't there a converse problem that because if this is an honest programme, its outcome is dependent... It is an honest programme. Its outcome is entirely go. dependent on chance. Yes. What happens if you spend all this money and there isn't a single winner in the week? Well, that, that is exactly the jeopardy that the contestants will face. And hopefully Head of we'll Entertainment make, gets and hope, fired, and gets fired we'll, in that case? Hope, hopefully we'll make it exciting for the viewers. But uh, it is an honest programme. Because you know, it, when you get to the end of an episode, you will, you, you, know, you will see this ball going around this wheel, and it will either drop in red or black, and depending on whether it does, they'll either get a million pounds or they'll get nothing. That, that, the repu the reputations of, of commissioners will depend on the outcome in the audience. Well, uh, um, the... the uh, <laughs> The Red or black? The lady's wearing black today. Will, will depend on whether it's a good programme. And, uh, and we, you know, we obviously believe in it and we're excited about it. Yes, yes. With, with, with <laughs> course, have you, have you prejudged you it, Ray, by any no, chance? Hardly, hardly, hardly at all. I'm sure it'll be wondrously exciting. And, uh, <laughs> Friday night, uh, one of your problem nights, you, didn't, you haven't mentioned it. Nothing's quite stuck on Friday night, has it? I think, funny enough, I think that's, uh, um, uh, that's a little bit about like the question about comedy, actually. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that's probably fair comment. I think that, that uh, if you go back 10 or 15 years, you'll find you go back... Actually, it might not even be as long as that. You go to a time when it was generally accepted that Saturday nights were in the doldrums and that people sort of thought, oh, God, the audience has given up on Saturday night television. Saturday nights came roaring back. Um, with the whole, you know, the generation of shows, not just on ITV1, but on the BBC1, the Strictly Come Dancing and so on, that, that are, in fact, the defining, the defining entertainment shows of the generation. Saturday spread to Sunday, um, uh, and, you know, The X Factor now plays on Saturday, Sunday. Uh, um, Strictly Dan Come Dancing plays Saturday, Sunday. You know, Sunday's also a night for big entertainment. So of those three nights of the weekend, the, the nights that were once the nights that London Weekend Television broadcast in, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I think that's a fair comment to say that the audience doesn't, to quite the same degree, know what to expect from Friday night. Yeah. I would say, I'd say that's an opportunity. You know, somebody could find, and, and we'd love to, find that defining show that's right for Saturday night in, as much, in the same way that The X Factor... Uh, all those other shows are right for the, for the weekend nights, for Saturday, Sunday. I'm about to shock you rigid by saying I'm a regular viewer to rock star to opera star. But uh, the rumour in the business has it that the only reason it has survived is it because it's Archie Norman's favourite programme. Is that right? No. no. Is it his favourite programme? I don't know. He's never said that to me. So, so you know, I, don't know, I don't know where you get your rumours. You get them from oh, strange... Oh, top quality. Who you top go to. quality. Every, every, <laughs> one, every one of them, Peter. Um, <laughs> it's called Pop Star to Star, by the way. So. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of your favourite programmes. Well, right? whatever, you know. Um, the, the, music, right. the, the music's good. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, Michael Grade famously described Google and Facebook as parasites. Do you agree? Um, I think, I think in, you know, we've seen, uh, this is not particularly new, but we're seeing it more and more, that, that actually television, broadcast television, and whether you're talking about new media, new platforms, you know, VOD, iPlayer, ITV player, or whether you're talking about social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and so on, they, they are absolutely... They're, they're fantastic partners. They go so strongly hand in hand together. Um, so I don't think one should think of them as, as rivals. So they, they're not gobbling television up. Television is, in fact, feeding them. I mean, during uh, the X Factor last Saturday, 
uh, the top 10 trends on Twitter, nine of them were X Factor while the X Factor was, uh, was running. During um, Essex, when the only way is Essex is going out, there's a tweet about it once a second. It's, it's, you know, and I'm sure you think most ITV... people in this room, uh, I'll bet, now look at, you know, when your new programme is going out, you watch your programme and you've got the Twitter thing going on. And, and I, I certainly do this with ITV programmes. Um, uh, and what, what it, you know, you get very raw reaction. You need, to, you need to be prepared to see things you don't want to read. But what it tells you is that people are interested in television, uh, they care about television, and they, they use new social media to talk about it all the time. So do, I do think you think, therefore, given that it's so important for the social media, or rather the traction it gets on social media, do you think ITV is properly compensated for what it provides? I mean, that's, a, that's uh, I sort of hear the implication of that question. The uh, two guys or have so, been so, incompetent. Yeah, so yeah. Is, is YouTube uh, marketing or is it exploitation? I mean, this is, yes. a, this is a big, but this is like the sort of debate that deserves a session of its own at the Edinburgh Festival. And I'm not sure that I've personally got anything original or, or any particular perspective to, to say. I can see both points of view. Um, I think, you know, if you, to use the most obvious example, uh, in terms of YouTube, you know, would Susan Boyle have been uh, uh, become a worldwide star so fast without YouTube? No, she wouldn't have done. Uh, you know, do we at ITV sit and look at that and think, well, well, hang on a minute, why can't we monetize that? Yeah, much debate goes on about that as well, exactly as you'd imagine. Okay. How bad? extreme is the tension between you as a commissioner, you with your team, of the best possible ideas and the need to fill up ITV studios with work? I, I don't think, uh, I, I, I mean, you, you're starting from the assumption that it's bad and that there's tension. I don't think it's that way at all. I think that, that it's, it's entirely understandable and right that if you're uh, if you're Archie Norman and Adam Crozier and you're, you're looking you know, at the whole of ITV, you will say, uh, when ITV networks uh, uh, commission ITV studios with you know, formats, intellectual property created by ITV studios that we can then exploit in various different ways, that is good for business. That's good for ITV business. But you can, you can, you can and they do, and we all do, keep that thought in your mind while keeping another thought in your mind which is that when you're in the extremely competitive business of commissioning and schedule a mainstream channel like ITV1, if you don't commission the, pro the right programmes for the viewers, you will come unstuck in ITV1. The, the, the art, if you like, in my job uh, and the job of, of the commissioning teams at ITV1 is to balance those two prerogatives in a, in a way that comes out with the best outcome. As I say, because we are, in a sense... Uh, we commission so many programmes, we have so few acquisitions in our schedule, um, uh, therefore we're hungry for programmes from all sources. Um, uh, so it, it, it is perfectly possible, and, and I think we will succeed in doing it, in both increasing the amount of stuff that we commission from ITV studios and the amount that we commission from indies. Are you happy, though, with the proportion of in-house hits that you create? Well, I, I, I don't think that... Uh, I mean, I don't think it's a kind of number-counting sort of thing. No channel controller is ever happy with the amount of hits that he or she has got. This is the sort of, this is what you find out when you run a channel. It's sort of slightly the opposite that you think if you're, if, you, if you're a producer, and I know I was a producer for many years. You think that the, the channel controller sits there thinking, you brought me a brilliant idea, but you know what, I've got so many other brilliant ideas that I'm gonna turn it down. It never, ever feels like that when you're on the other side of the, the fence. You're always thinking, these are the strong things in my schedule, but I've got weaknesses in my schedule here and there, and I want to strengthen them. So your door will always be open for a brilliant idea, uh, for a hit programme from any source. And rightly so, because what, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're interpreting what the audience, what you hope and believe the audience will want. Is there genuine space in your ITV world for new on-screen talent. One looks, at, um, one looks at Mr. Childs, one, look, one looks at Ms. Blakely, one looks now at Jonathan Ross. You seem to be importing most of your new okay. talent from the well, BBC. Well, last Saturday we relaunched the, um, the X Factor 
uh, with, with four judges. Well, I'll just pick up one of, the, one of those judges, uh, Talisa. I would imagine prior to announcing she was an X Factor would have been known to quite a small proportion of the ITV1 audience. Um, uh, by Monday, uh, in a poll in one of the newspapers, she was the most popular new judge. If that isn't an example of backing new talent, not in, not in some... No, I, 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 I wasn't not talking in, about not, judges, actually. Not in, not, in, not, not in some show at the fringes of the schedule, but in the biggest and most important entertainment show we have in the heart of the yep. schedule, the, that's, that's backing new talent. OK. Um, anyone want to make a live appearance uh, other than the other than the tweets? We've got microphones and old-fashioned technology like that. If anybody, well, ah, yes, there is someone there, and uh, get the microphone to him. Say who you are, sir, so we know to aim off against your prejudices. Anyone else so we can get a second microphone? Uh, hi, Daniel Tool. Uh, ITV. I, I think I'm right in saying it was Anglia used to uh, broadcast a great programme called Survival. In this new world where you're putting some factual on ITV, is there any space for natural history, or do you still see that as the preserve of discovery in the BBC? Sky's taken a position recently. What's your view? Um, I, 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 something we've discussed a lot. Um, we actually revived Survival uh, about 18 months ago um, uh, because I thought it was a fantastic brand, uh, we've actually got a, a, a series running at the moment called Tales from the Wild, which is an archive series because there's such a fantastic archive uh, in survival. Um, uh, we've, uh, we, we have a new series which launched very successfully last autumn is coming back called uh, Ray Mears Wild Britain. Um, uh, I think if you've, like me, run BBC One for a few years where there's this fantastic wealth of natural history, you, you, you know, at ITV you think, well... Natural history, audiences love natural history, but, but by goodness, you've, you, 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 you know, you, you've got a big thing to compete with there. Um, and I can't, if I'm absolutely honest, see ITV1 sort of taking on planet Earth or its successors head to head. Um, uh, and I don't, think, you know, I don't think we need to match BBC1 genre for genre in, in all respects. But... Uh, I'd love to do more uh, in you know, the sort that Ray Mears Wild Britain is, um, which has been very successful. Um, and, and I think you'll see a certain amount more like that. Anyone else uh, from the audience would, would like a microphone? It seems that it's a very reticent and shy crowd of people. Uh, no, there's oh, this. I'm glad, sir, for your presence. Hello, my name's Sean Devine. Hold on, hold on, Mr Devine. My name's Sean Devine. It's a little bit sad, but I've literally locked myself away for the last two years because I have a brilliant idea for event television. And you just said that the door's always open for brilliant ideas. Now, at a stretch, I could say that I'm a creative company, but I'm an individual. What, what do I do with my brilliant idea? Well, you, you, depending on which genre it's in... It's, you, a, it's a music-themed event, no, no, better it, than well, The Voice. Sounds probably... Would you like to tell us about it in more detail, perhaps? <laughs> I don't, I don't. Someone's going to steal it. Exactly. Um, you, 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 you submit it to one of the entertainment commissioners, um, and you know, on our website you'll find the names of the entertainment commissioning team, and we, like all other broadcasters, have a perfectly normal system of, of responding to ideas uh, when they come in, and... And so, you know, if you do that, you will hear from somebody. And, and if, you know, if there's interest in it, we think this is something that we could do something with, then um, you'd be you know, invited in for a meeting. I mean, this is, you know, that's, in a sense, the way all broadcasters work commissioning. Would I have to disclose what the idea is, or can I just sort of frame what... what... Um, there is a history I, I, I of mean, ideas I'll, I'll being be, ripped be, off. Well, I, 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 we don't rip ideas off. We respect intellectual property, absolutely. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. When, when people approach and say, I've got a great idea, but I'm not going to tell you what it is, it is quite difficult to know how to respond to that. <laughs> quite, it's quite often, actually. Um, or they want to be in an underground car park or whatever, and then they'll tell you the idea. But, no, but if, um, if you I, I don't think, in, in all seriousness, I don't think you should feel any fear from disclosure of the idea. Uh, broadcasters, uh, you, you know, for, for absolutely the obvious reason, 
uh, act in, you, you know, have, have systems, act in a professional way, respect intellectual property. Um, uh, we, we, we wouldn't, you, you know, in, in any circumstance, want to find ourselves in a position where somebody could say, I submit to you that idea, you turn it down, and then you did it separately. We wouldn't do that. Okay. Peter Finson, we're nearly, at, we're nearly at the end. I just want to return momentarily to the um, grubby business of money. Um, ITV has returned to profit on, the, on, on an upswing, at least for now, on an upswing of advertising revenue. Rather like a football manager whose star player has been sold for many, many millions, do you get to see any of that money in the programme department, or does Adam and his friend just, just run off with it to the stock market? Well, um, uh, uh, ITV is a, a public limited company, so th th nobody runs off with the money. Um, uh, we're, we're there. We've, we've just uh, an, an, an announced a dividend for the first time in a while, so we are, we are there to uh, provide returns for our shareholders. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing to be ashamed of in that. That's, that's the business we're in. Um, but but the, do you get but any no, extras? My, is my no, slightly more serious no, question. The, the more, the, the, no, the, there is a serious question under that. And, and in fact, I think it takes you takes back takes us back to when you were saying, you, you know, are they going to make it into a baked bean factory or whatever? Well, judge, judge the, the senior management of ITV by what they do in terms of continuing to invest at the, you know, the, 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 the level that is necessary in the channels that we run. Uh, they have, we are, uh, our, our program budget, our network program budget is, is what I need to do the job. Uh, they're not diverting money away to put into you, you know, different activities or, or things that aren't relevant to the, to the core of the business. So you, you know, I think that's a really important message, if you like, to end on. We are in the business of commissioning original programmes that was entirely from UK companies. Uh, um, uh, looking forward over the next few years, we will continue to be in that business. I don't see that changing to any significant degree. And we have, as we have now, a rich schedule with the expensive genres like drama uh, and the bigger entertainment extremely well represented. We haven't thinned out the schedule or made it, made it you know, cheap and cheerful. Uh, I believe ITV's destiny lies in the quality of the programmes that it does, and there's no shortcut to doing that without proper investment. And finally, as I started, back to Peter Fincham, the person, again. You can't be ITV's director of television forever. No one can. If, if you're offered the director generalship of the BBC, would you accept it? <laughs> That's a... T no. I, I, the you, did you... No? no really. Are you sure? This is a... You know, have you stopped beating your wife type question? No, what not. can you say to there, that question? No, but there, there could be a vacancy. Um, uh, you're a television professional. I, you could be, it's a straightforward I, question. I, if oh, you were know. offered it, would you accept? It's not going to happen. I, I, do you know what? I, I was at the BBC for actually, with hindsight, a very short period of time. I love my time at the BBC. I've been at, the, at ITV now substantially longer than I was at the BBC, I think a year longer. Than, uh, I'm very much at home ITV. I think ITV's where I'm very happy to belong. I think the notion of me ever going back to the BBC is a highly improbable notion under any circumstances. So, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be running, you know, director of television for ITV as long as. As, as Adam Crozier and Archie, what, Archie Norman want me to, to do so, and I ain't going anywhere. And finally, 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 what's the, what's the future of your band? <laughs> no expectation. Well, we are embarking on a European tour this autumn. <laughs> so there is a future after ITV. Uh, unfortunately, it only consists of one date, um, which is at MIPCOM uh, on October the 3rd, where we're playing, at, I think it's called Club C21 on the beach. Um, uh, uh, Tim Hinks actually sent me a text earlier saying, I said, are you in Edinburgh? He said, no, I'm in France and I'm on my way down to the beach. So he's turned up a month early, in fact, for our gig. <laughs> <laughs> so that's him. He likes to be louder than everybody else. So we, I don't know, we're a very occasional band. Um, it's only a joke, I promise. Um, uh, but we aren't playing in Edinburgh this year, but we are playing at MIPCOM. So if you're in MIPCOM, do come and see us. Peter Finchon, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for being a terrific audience. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Okay. I'll get it all right.